Good morning, Encompass Church. How's everybody doing today? We're all starting to warm up here now, aren't we? With the, I feel like we almost could, just had like a week of spring and then we're right into summertime. Doesn't it almost feel like that? Well, you guys, why don't you stand with me this morning here? We're going to uh, have a little time of worshiping our Lord this morning. Uh, it's a good day to worship the Lord. You can see we've got a few folks out, uh, vacation and other reasons, those kind of things. But God's still good. God's here. He still deserves our praise this morning. Amen. So we'll, we're going to take that time to, uh, to uh, worship him. Let me open us up in prayer. Lord, we just welcome you here in this place today. Have your way in our hearts, Lord. We just pray you receive our praise, Lord. You're, you're so worthy of it, God. You are holy. You are a holy, holy, holy God. You're far above all of this world, Lord. We thank you that we can turn our eyes to you this morning, God. Fix them on you and lift you up and give you the praise you're due. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy, 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 Lord, 
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the I was reminded of Jordan uh, Tellman had shared with me about that song about Hosanna. I mean, save us, save us now. That's just it, you guys, is we need God's salvation every day. His salvation isn't just to get us into heaven. It's literally a daily salvation. His, by his grace, he empowers us to live the life he's called us to live. And we can't just do it on our own. We can't just try hard enough. We literally need God, God's spirit in us, guiding us reading his word, guiding us by his word as to what he'd have us to do today. So uh, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, he, and he's more than just a God that sits off. He's a God that helps us in our lives. He's our, our ever-present help in times of trouble. So this morning as Woody leads us in what a friend we have in Jesus, just remember what a, what a good God he is. He's not a God that stands far off. He's a God that rolls up his sleeves and helps us every day. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we offer
Thank you, buddy. You're so fun. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, he will Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can see I am free and not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to when the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for paying it all for us, God, for not just standing far off, God, but coming down and doing what we couldn't do. Thank you. Uh, Lord, we just pray over the rest of this time today, Lord. Uh, we lift up Pastor Kevin. We just pray that you encourage him, empower him to share all that you've uh, put on his heart to share with us today. Lord, we pray that you open our ears and open our hearts to receive that. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys, at this time, I think we have, uh, do we have the kids going out now? All right, yes, there's the sign. I just saw it back there. All right, so all you kids, there's a sign in the back. Uh, they're holding it up back there. You guys are dismissed to, to go there. And then everybody else, we can just take a minute to greet somebody around you here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to Encompass Church. It's good to be here. Ah. <laughs> In a couple Sundays, we're going to have all welcome. So you come, you can talk to each other. And uh, for 45 minutes, un uninterrupted joy. But today is not that day. So I have a couple announcements, and uh, we'll get through them really quickly. One, of course, the most important one is welcome. Welcome to those that are new. Welcome those that keep up coming every week. We're, all, we're excited you're all here, especially the new ones. We always know it's always a, a challenge looking for a new church, and we're glad you've walked in our doors. So we, any way we can help you feel more welcome, uh, please reach out to any of us, and we'll, uh, we'll be glad to do anything we can do. My name is Ron Brum. I'm one of the elders here, and um, we're excited you're here. I want to talk about Connect Cards, which are in the program, if you got one of those. Um, these are here. You can go to uh, the program and do the uh, little code and flash that, and it'll take you right to our website. Either way, uh, it's a way for us to connect with you, get to know what you're thinking. Um, you can ask questions. You can give us prayer requests, which we take very seriously. And uh, the first time you do it, you get a Starbucks card, so there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, when it's 90 degrees, it's hard to be excited about a Starbucks card. But maybe you can get one of the cool drinks that'll cool us off. A guest reception is every week except for this Sunday. It's not going to be occurring. 
and I'll explain why in a little bit, but it's at 1045, which is right after the first service. And it's a way for you to get to under, learn more about us, the inner workings. You get to meet Pastor Kevin and a lot of people in the church will be there. And there's, of course, Tasty Treats, which we're all excited. Um, and the nice thing about it is if you have children, uh, we have classes for them so you can send them off there and not be worried about it. And when the guest reception is over, you can come and pick them up. So please take advantage of that. It's just at the top of the stairs. And the reason why we're not going to have guest reception is we're having our annual meeting. It's once a year. And today it's at 1045, which will be right after this service. There's some agendas in the lobby if you haven't got one already. Uh, we won't hold our normal groups or student ministries, but the children programs, classes, and nursery, that will all be there as usual. And all members are in in asked to attend. Um, you're going to hear what's, what's happened, kind of review of what we, where we've been and where we're going and what our plans are. And then we have some, a couple of things we need to vote about. If you're not a member, you're also welcome to come. Uh, we do have some, some of the things we're gonna vote are for members only, but you're welcome to stay and learn, you know, a great way to learn more about our church because we're gonna be talking so much about what, what's going on. Uh, we have a few other things, the partner potluck. It's June 19th, so that'll be next Sunday at 12.30. And we're going to have some of our international partners talk about their ministries in Latin America. So just bring a dish. We'll, we'll have lunch first, and then they'll come up and talk about what's going on in the ministries. And um, it's a great time to learn where our, um, the people we support, what they're actually doing to bring the Lord to the many nations. Now, there are a lot of other events, which I'm not going to talk about. They're actually in our program. They're online. And if you connect to our Connect card, That'll automatically sign you up to an email that goes out every Friday that explains everything that's going on, or almost everything. So um, we also have the blood drive on Friday, June 24th, and our life decisions event on June 25th, both really important. So um, please take advantage of both those events if you're able to make that. So let's uh, close our eyes in prayer. Dear God, we ask you to bless us through Pastor Kevin's teachings today, may his words be your words. We ask that our heart be open, our, our ears would be open, they'll be open to what, what you want us to learn and how your word, how we can incorporate it into our lives uh, as we reach others. We pray that we'll be unified as we share our plans for the future of Encompass during our family meeting. We also pray for our nation. We're in a difficult time seems to be a lot of disagreements about everything. So we, we ask and we know that when we turn to you, Lord, for wisdom and guidance, you'll lead us in the right direction. Uh, all blessings come from you. All understanding comes from you. Lord, we just ask that we depend on you in all that we do and all that we say. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm glad that you're here with us this morning. My name is Kevin Clark. I'm the pastor here at Encompass Church. And we are in the second week of a four-week series called Reboot. Uh, Timothy Paul Jones and Daniel Montgomery are co-authors of a book called Proof, Finding Freedom Through the Intoxicating Joy of Irresistible Grace. And in that book, there are several stories about each of their families. And one of the stories jumped out at me. Uh, Timothy Jones was talking about his adopted daughter and a family trip to Disney World. And because of the adoption connection, we have adoption in our family. Um, it kind of resonated with me and it fits our message today. And so I wanted to read a portion of that story. He says, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult or that such a trip could, yeah, where, where did he live? <laughs> or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family, and I'm sure this couple had the best of intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. And after a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming their eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, 
Whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she'd seen many pictures of Disney World and she'd heard about the rides and characters and parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left outside. Once I found out about her history, I made plans to take her with our family to Disney World the next time one of my speaking engagements took us to the area. Now, I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill, and I knew from previous experience that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotional instability. But what I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting, visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before we headed to Florida, I pulled her into my lap to talk through her latest escapade. She immediately said, I know what you're going to do. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before. So now she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. It's June, summer is here, <clears throat> and something switches in my brain in summertime. I don't know if it is, does for you. Uh, your brain just kind of mentally detaches a little more than usual. You start to think, ah, oh, it's time for a break. And I think part of that is the residual effect of the fact that most of us went to school on a calendar that allowed us approximately a three-month break every summer. And we never shed that desire, did we? And so summers uh, often feel like a time to unplug and to get outside and to be with family and friends and to find some time to rest and to recharge and to reflect and sometimes even to reevaluate where our lives are going. And when we do, we might ask ourselves the question, why am I doing what I'm doing? <clears throat> some of us would probably have to answer, you know, I haven't thought about it in a long time and I really have no idea why I'm doing what I'm doing. And we might take some time to think about what changes we'd like to put into our lives uh, going into the summer that would reorient us. But some of us, we answer that question and say, I know exactly why I do what I do. But at the same time, we might wonder if we're using our time to do the things that we think are valuable and using it well. And so summer is an opportunity to refocus our priorities, to remind ourselves what is most important in life. It's a time to actually reboot. Summer's also a really great time for a church, for a community of faith, to reevaluate or to reboot. Now, I mentioned last week that our mission statement says we exist to honor God by developing more disciple making followers of Jesus Christ. So, we're here to make Jesus followers. But what do Jesus followers do? Our vision statement gives four things that we think are a critical part of every Jesus follower's life. They're not the only four things, but they are four that we think are incredibly essential. And the vision statement says this, our vision is to be a place where people discover a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, connect with caring, like-minded fellow believers, grow in spiritual, emotional, and relational maturity, and serve each other, the local community, and the world. So four things that we believe a Jesus follower should incorporate into his or her life. Discover, connect, 
grow, and serve. And all those words have very simple, easy to understand meanings, but when you put them into Jesus' hands, those activities, those processes begin to transform us into the people he's designed us to be. Now, last week we talked about what Jesus does when we discover a vibrant relationship with him. And I said he transforms our heads, our hearts, and our hands to make us the kind of people he has created us to be. We actually heard him say to the first four disciples that he chose on a beach on the Sea of Galilee, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But like being fishers of fish, fishers of men have to learn not only how to catch the fish, but what to do with them after they catch them. So today we're gonna to explore one of the key things that as Christ followers, we are meant to do after the catch. And that is to help people who have begun a relationship with Jesus Christ connect with caring, like-minded fellow believers. So if you have a Bible or perhaps a Bible app, you can go to Matthew chapter nine, verses nine to 13. Last week, we saw Jesus call his first four disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And today we'll see the fifth disciple that we are going to talk about in this series, and that's the disciple Matthew. But let me give you a little bit of background. In this particular season, Jesus is on the move across northern Israel, across a region known as Galilee. And crowds were starting to follow him. He was speaking truth they had not heard before. He was doing miracles. He was creating controversy. Word was spreading. And right in the middle of all of that activity, all of that excitement, Jesus was walking through a town, saw a tax collection booth, walked up to it and stopped to speak directly to the person inside. A person that nearly every person in the crowd expected Jesus to intentionally avoid. Look at Matthew chapter nine, verse nine. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. <clears throat> now, this is the very first mention we have of Matthew or Levi, as he is called in the early pages of two of the other gospels. Since this is the first mention of him, it's logical for, for us to assume that this was probably the very first time that Matthew met Jesus. But most Bible scholars think that Matthew at least had a passing familiarity with Jesus. He had probably heard him teach. He might have possibly even met him face to face in an unrecorded encounter. Now, in first century Israel, when your workday ended, you didn't go home and turn on the latest Colorado Avalanche game. You didn't turn on Netflix. Uh, you didn't go to Prime on your computer. Uh, there wasn't a lot in the world of entertainment that was available to you. You could socialize with family and friends, and they did have activities that they did, but there weren't the big kind of things that seemed to attract our attention. So when the Traveling Jesus show walked into town, everybody would make plans to go. His word about him had been spreading and they would want to hear what he had to say and to see if he was going to do something unexpected. Now, last week we read Matthew chapter four, verses 23 and 24. And it says, and he, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. So by the time Jesus met Matthew, he had traveled all over Galilee, which was the northernmost region of the nation of Israel. He'd done all kinds of unusual things, but his fame had spread beyond that. It said it had spread throughout all of Syria. Now, Syria was the Roman province that included Galilee, but also included the region to the north of that. So Jesus's reputation has gone far beyond just the local area everyone in the region probably knew who he was, and many had probably seen him in person. Matthew was probably a person who had seen Jesus walking and talking and teaching and doing the things that he did, 
because Matthew was in that same region in, in which Jesus was traveling. And it's even likely that he went more than once. But on this day, Jesus stopped and spoke directly to Matthew. He said, follow me. And scripture tells us Matthew did. He walked out of the tax booth and he followed Jesus. And that would have completely shocked the crowd. Now they knew when Jesus said, follow me, he wasn't saying, hey, come gather there with this group of people who hangs out when I come into town and listens to what I have to say. He was saying, leave your life behind. Become one of my disciples. Go where I go. Eat what I eat. Sleep where I sleep. Do what I do. Be like me. And everyone who knew the type of invitation that Jesus was extending to Matthew knew what it meant. Matthew would have to give everything up. But they weren't shocked about what Matthew was giving up. They were shocked because Jesus chose a man like Matthew. Matthew didn't have any of the qualities that a God-honoring, self-respecting, traveling Jewish rabbi would be looking for in a disciple. Now, last week I told you that there were lots of traveling teachers, rabbis is what they were called, in the first century world. And most of them had followers who stuck close to them that they would call disciples. But most rabbis were seeking out young men who at least gave the appearance of following God's law. And often they were choosing young men who also could bring attention to the rabbi himself because of the young man's wealth, his family connections, his education, his influence, his respect, or his standing in the community. Matthew had none of that. Matthew was not one of the best of the best. Now, he was undoubtedly educated, and he was probably wealthy, and he probably came from an influential family, or else he wouldn't have the job that he had. But Matthew was a tax collector, and tax collectors were traitors to the Jewish people. They were Jews who got their jobs by making a large bribe to a local Roman government official. And when they were assigned their jobs, which were, was collecting taxes from their own people, they were permitted to, to charge additional exorbitant fees in order to pay for their own services. And they could keep those fees for themselves. And so in some ways, they were like the local mafia running an extortion racket against their neighbors. In addition to paying your taxes, you have to pay that fee. So I make sure that your money goes where it's going to go and you are protected. On top of that, tax collectors were almost always considered religiously unclean. Jews by the Old Testament law were not allowed to touch something or someone that was unclean and then go to the temple. If they did come into contact with someone or something unclean, they had to do some type of ritual washing, and there was a prescribed period of time before they could enter into the temple. Touching a Gentile, a non-Jew, or touching the Gentile's money made you unclean. And since tax collectors had daily contact with Gentiles as well as Jews and their money, they were thought to be always unclean. So faithful Jews avoided them because they detested them and because they expected that they were effectively atheists within their people. Matthew had nothing that a rabbi would seek in a disciple. So what did Jesus' call to him tell the crowd? And what should it tell us? What it should tell us is that the call to follow Jesus is open to anyone who is willing to say yes. Now, I think it's tempting, if you're a little bit like me, to picture Matthew as an anomaly, a rare, good tax collector who was stuck against his will 
in his unfortunate job, who had no friends and was longing for an escape. But that's actually unlikely. Shortly after he agrees to follow Jesus, Matthew tells us by his actions that he traveled in a pretty big circle of friends and probably enjoyed that travel. Chapter 9, verse 10 says this, that Matthew held a party. And it says, as Jesus reclined at the table in Matthew's house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So in the very next scene, after Jesus calls Matthew and he follows Jesus, we're told Jesus is hanging out at a dinner party with lots of tax collectors and other people with less than stellar reputations. Prostitutes, people that we would think of like drug dealers, thugs, those who had no place in Jewish society. Now, the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 to 29, tells us Matthew, or Levi, is the one who hosted the party and invited the people to attend it. It says this, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. It's repeating the same story we just read in Matthew. And then it says, And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him, Jesus, a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. So Matthew or Levi was a guy with family or friends or connections that he invited to the party. But they were not the kind of people that polite society would want to hang out with. He was part of the wrong crowd, probably a wealthy and successful crowd, but one which thrived on things that the Jews said were sinful. And it's actually not unreasonable for us to wonder if Matthew perhaps had distanced himself from the daily practice of his religious faith simply because he was no longer accepted by the Jewish people. Like Timothy Paul Jones' adopted daughter in the story that I read a moment ago, he might, we don't know for certain, but he might have reached the place where he assumed that nothing he could do would get him into the magic kingdom. When Jesus stopped and said to him, follow me, there must have been a shocked silence or an unpleasant murmur throughout the crowd because they saw Matthew as an unclean traitor to their cause. And they must have remembered, or must have wondered rather, why Jesus would choose him none of them would have guessed that Matthew was actually interested in knowing Jesus. And like you and I probably would have done if we were in that crowd, they probably assumed that because of his lifestyle, he had zero interest in God at all. And yet Jesus saw a man who was willing to give up everything to have a real experience with God. After Matthew said yes, he hosted a party. And we don't know if the party was his idea or maybe it was Jesus' idea. In my head, I can imagine that when Matthew got up and said, yes, I'll follow you, that Jesus said, hey, let me introduce you to my other disciples. This is Simon, Andrew, James, and John. You guys need to get connected. You need to get to know each other. Um, And Matthew, I'd kind of like to meet some of your friends. How about we throw a party? Now, I'm totally speculating, I'm imagining that does not occur in Scripture. But it is interesting to notice that in the earliest moments of his faith in Jesus, Matthew realized that his new life was going to be partly or fully about relationships with not only Jesus, but with those who followed him already. Now, you and I tend to treat our walk with Jesus as an individual sport. It's the culture we live in. It's the way we think. We believe we can live the Christian life essentially in internal isolation. Just me and Jesus. And if anyone could have made that claim, it would have been Matthew or one of those early disciples. They could have said, Jesus is right here with me. I have everything I need in him. 
I don't really need the rest of you guys. But throughout his time with them, Jesus stressed their need for time with one another. Near the end of his ministry, he told them their need would be greater when he departed. And so they must treat each other the way he treated them. In the book of John, chapter 13, verses 33 to 35, he said this. Little children, and he's speaking to the disciples, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus said, when I am gone, it is your job to stay connected with each other, to love one another. Real connection requires love for each other. Not only back then, but it requires it right now too. And by love, Jesus wasn't speaking of that kind of general goodwill we uh, sort of express when someone asks if we love someone we don't really love, but we have to love because they're in the church here. Um, and it's not that kind of goodwill that says, yeah, if they need something, they know they can come to me. If I have some extra time and some extra cash, I'll be glad to help out. That's my love. Jesus was speaking of love that shows personal sacrifice, that shows extraordinary humility, that puts the needs of the person who is being loved ahead of your own needs. On the night he commanded his disciples to love each other, he demonstrated that kind of love by washing their feet, the lowest, most disgusting job of the least important household servant or slave in any household. The king, the sinless son of God, loved 12 sinful men by putting their needs before his own. And he demonstrated his love through humility. And so we could say that real connection requires humility toward each other. In John 13, verses 14 and 15, he commanded his followers, which includes us by extension, to do what he did for them on that night. He said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now the question is, was Matthew, the tax collector, already showing love and humility to Jesus' other disciples on the night he invited all of them to his house for a party? And the answer is, we don't really know because there isn't a lot of detail. And after all, Matthew had just discovered this newfound relationship with Jesus, and it was all brand new to him. But he was already demonstrating a beginner's grasp of what it means to be connected with other believers as a committed follower of Jesus. How was he doing that? He was doing two important things. He was associating and he was consecrating with them. What do I mean by that? There's a book that I've read several times by an author named Jim Putnam. He's not the only one who wrote it, but um, it's a book called Disciple Shift. And it talks about changing the way we think about how to be disciple-making followers of Jesus. It's very others-focused and not self-focused. It's a very intriguing book. But in the course of this book, he talks about our connections to other believers. And he says connection must always include two essential parts, associating in meaningful ways with other disciples and consecrating ourselves together to God. He describes the first part, association, this way. He says association means that like Jesus, we establish ongoing relational connections with those who have responded to him. Jesus concentrated on and developed close relationships with a few who were drawn to him. They walked the trails together. They went to the synagogue together. They went up a mountain and spent time away from the pressures of regular work. And together as a small group of Christ followers, they internalized Jesus' beliefs, 
practices, and emotions. So real connection requires association in a meaningful way, serious quality time spent with other believers. Now, Matthew, even at his earliest stage in his relationship with Jesus, made a decision to associate, to identify with other believers in meaningful ways. And we know that as we follow the course of the Gospels, that those relationships with those other men became more and more integral to his daily life as time passed along. And they enjoyed celebrations together, they faced hardships together, they identified with each other both privately and publicly. And everyone who saw them knew that they belonged together. Putnam also says in his book, Discipleship, that connection requires obedience to Jesus together, not just individually. Matthew also made the decision to consecrate himself or to obey Jesus. He knew when he responded to Jesus' call to follow him, that that was more than just show up once in a while and hear what I have to say. It was a an invitation that was go where I go, eat what I eat, sleep where I sleep, do what I do, learn what I teach and become my representative. And it all essentially came down to one command. And that what the command was obey me as your master. And so by walking away from his tax position, his other master, Rome, he, something that was probably irreversible once he had done it, he committed to obey Jesus. Putnam says this consecration, this obedience, means that like Jesus, we help people to obey God's teachings. The invitation Jesus gave to his disciples was not to accept me or believe what I teach. It was an invitation to follow him in obedience. Obedience marks us as followers of Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said that very explicitly. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, obeying God's teachings is not what saves us from our sins. Only Jesus Christ's death on the cross can save us from our sin. But obedience after salvation demonstrates that we've been genuinely saved. And ongoing unrepentant disobedience may demonstrate that we have not. But obedience is hard, and it's critically hard to do it when we're trying to do it alone. In order to actually successfully obey what Jesus Christ has called us to obey, we need connections with other Christians who know the areas that are hard for us to obey in. They know the temptations that we're facing. They know realistically that we are not mostly perfect Christians and that we need their encouragement and help and vice versa. Jesus said, it's your obedience to me, not your feelings about me that shows that you love me. Now, some who were present that night when Matthew threw the party clearly did not love Jesus and had no interest in obeying his commands, which were the commands of God. And at the same time, they believed they were right with God. And I'm not talking about the tax collectors and the ones they called sinners. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 11 to 13. It says, and when the Pharisees saw this, that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners at the party, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now we understand from the text that the Pharisees probably were at the party, but perhaps were mingling on the outer fringes. They weren't definitely weren't sitting at the table 
or associating with the undesirables. Now, whether they'd been invited by Matthew or they had simply invited themselves so they could criticize Jesus, we don't know. But we do know they were supremely confident that they were right with God, that they obeyed him to the letter of the law. And their interpretation of the law didn't allow a quote unquote righteous person like themselves to eat at the same table with the unrighteous and the unclean. So they waited on the periphery, most likely, for Jesus' disciples to wander by close enough for them to ask a challenging and accusing question. Why does Jesus eat with sinners? Now Luke record, records the exact same question with one striking difference. When the Pharisees challenge the disciples in Luke, they ask them, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? And the word you is a plural in the Greek. The Pharisees were accusing not only Jesus, they were accusing the disciples too. And by asking this question the way they asked, they were admitting something that we need to keep in the back of our minds. And that is that they saw these men as connected. Not only were they connected with Jesus, but with each other. You as a group are obeying this man who is doing something that we don't believe he should be doing. Now, when the Pharisees question was reported to Jesus, he responded, those who are sick with sin need me, the physician, not those who are well. Did Jesus mean that the Pharisees were well? that they had no sin? No, he did not mean that. They needed him too, but they weren't able to see it. They weren't in the frame of mind or the willingness of heart to recognize what he was challenging them with. So he called out their sin, a lack of care and mercy and compassion for those who do not know Jesus, who do not follow God. And he called it out by using the very same law that they thought made them righteous. He quotes Hosea chapter six, verse six. First he says, go and learn what this means. And then he quotes their scripture where God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus was saying to them, you think you are faithful followers of God because you live by a system which you think makes you righteous. But God has made plain to me, his son, his followers, and all those who are willing to listen that the only thing that measures you as righteous is if you obey me and you connect with others in a way that lifts up and affirms and introduces them to me as well. Those who follow me must, must live out my character for the benefit of each other. Rules don't mark us as followers. Mercy coming from a heart of love and humility is what would mark you as a follower. My disciples, those who are truly my disciples, will be known for those character qualities. And together, they will encourage one another, lift one another up, and remind one another that they belong to me. Timothy Paul Jones' adopted daughter had been promised a trip to Disney World. <coughs> the Magic Kingdom. His previous adopt, or rather her previous adopted family had left her with a family friend every time their biological kids were taken to Disney World. When she began to misbehave prior to the Jones family trip, her new father, Timothy, sat her on, her, on his lap and began to discuss her behavior. And she said, I know what this is going to lead to already. You are not going to take me to Disney World, are you? She knew she could never earn the trip. Timothy writes, in retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that I was tempted to turn her fear to my advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. 
but by God's grace, I did not say that. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, her brown eyes wide and with tears on the edges. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Yes, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and wrong, but you're part of our family. We're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behaviors grew better after that moment, but they didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and every rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we went to Disney World on the day we promised, and it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider going again someday. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted and a little weepy, but her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime came, I prayed with her, hugged her, and asked, how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It's because I was yours. When Jesus calls us to be his followers, it's not because we're good, because we're not. None of us are good. We're hopelessly sinful and we're lost without him. Yet for his reasons, he chose you and me to be his family. And that is hard to remember when, <coughs> pardon me, that is hard to remember when we do the Christian life alone. You and I need connections with people who can remind us that we belong to him. Have you discovered a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you connected with caring, like-minded fellow believers who will challenge you and encourage you and lift you up and remind you that you are his? If not, maybe this summer is time for a reboot. Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, we are grateful that you have chosen us to come into your family of faith. We know that we could never earn our way through the gates of your kingdom. And there's nothing we could do to get any closer to you beyond actually just reaching out to you, knowing that you have made it possible through what your son has done for us. We are so grateful for that. Lord, so many of us try to do this Christian life alone. We're not very connected. Maybe we have superficial relationships or friendships that we think give us just enough to get by, but we're really running this race by ourselves. And Lord, you know how hard that is for us. And so we pray that you will help us not to wait, hoping that someone else will connect with us, but to reach out and connect with someone else who's following you and to grow in our faith because of that. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us and we'll sing our last song together. You are good. 
kindness leads me to repentance. Your goodness draws me to your side. Your mercy calls me to be like you. And your favor is my delight. Every day I awaken my praise and pour out a song from my heart. Oh, you are good. You are good. Thanks for being here with us today. <clears throat> we're glad that you were here. If you are a member, we encourage you to stick around. We'll be starting our, our meeting here in this room uh, very shortly. There are ballots out in the lobby. So if you'll go there, there are people that'll help check you off our membership list and pick up your ballot and you can bring that back in. But you have a few minutes to mingle and chat and we'll start, start promptly at 1045. So the rest of you, uh, you're welcome to join us and uh, to hear what's going to be happening, what has happened here at our church. But if you have other plans for this morning, we just pray that you will be blessed in the rest of your weekend. So have a great day and we will see you soon.